Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to another one of Park Lane Plowden's Law with Lunch sessions. I can see that there are 40 odd of you now watching, including lots of familiar names like Gareth and Vicky and Michelle and Wayne. So that's good to see. Hopefully, many of you are now familiar with the format. Uh, but if you're not, the idea is that we provide what we call bite-sized training sessions, really, on topics of interest and value. Uh, Stephen and myself, who are both obviously barristers at Park Lane Plowden, relatively recently hosted three sessions on similar and related cases called Ricks, Head and Hill. At the time, we called that something of a trilogy. Um, but we've decided to milk the franchise one more time. And in this final fourth instalment, we're going to do two things. Uh, one is to do a relatively quick recap of those three cases. And the second thing is to put the lessons learned from those cases into practice by applying them to a relatively simple, fictitious scenario. In terms of the structure, I'll probably do most of the first half because I'll deal with the recap. And then Stephen's gonna do most, but not all of the second half because he's gonna talk about the scenario and some of the questions arising from it. Hopefully you've all received by email a really simple handout, which includes a summary of the cases and the scenario. If you haven't, don't panic. Um, at the end of this, it's going to be difficult to ask questions, probably, even on chat. So please feel free uh, to send myself or Stephen any questions you've got by email. OK, uh, well, without further ado, um, I suggest we make a proper start and I'll deal with part one, which is the recap of the three cases. The first case in time was the case of Ricks which was a case from 2020 in the High Court. In terms of the background, the deceased in that case was a husband wealth maker running the family business, uh, and he died of mesothelioma. The claimant in the claim was the wife, and she had a financial dependency claim. The claim was a, for a conventional loss on the percentage method based on the income derived from the business. In the alternative, there was a claim for the cost of replacing the de deceased services as the managing director of the family business. The defendant was arguing for no loss under Section 3 of the Act uh, on the basis that the business became more profitable after the deceased's death. The case was complicated by the fact some of the deceased income and then claimants was derived from profit generated from a commercial property. At court, the judge decided to adopt the conventional approach and damages were awarded. In terms of the principles that we can derive from the case, there are a few. The first was to restate one of the main principles of Fatal Accidents Act cases, which is that the dependency is generally fixed at the date of death. The second was that when we're looking at businesses and structures, it's the practical realities of the business that matter and not the corporate financial or tax structures employed. In addition, the court tried to draw a distinction between different types of income, which can or cannot be included as part of a financial dependency claim. And in particular, where income was enjoyed from an inherited capital asset, such as the commercial property, that is not a dependency loss. However, if the income is derived entirely from the deceased's labour and skill whilst working within the business, then that can be treated in the conventional way. And obviously in this case, because the deceased was the MD and the income was generated from his capital and skill, the conventional approach was taken. So one down, two to go. That was Rick's. The next in time was the case of Head. That was a case from 2021, and that was a Court of Appeal decision. In that case, uh, the deceased husband brought a claim whilst he was alive related to mesothelioma he'd contracted at work. 
He actually went on to die after the first instance decision, but obviously that didn't frustrate the original decision. On appeal, uh, the claimant was the wife and the executrix of the estate. Again, we're dealing with a similar kind of scenario because the deceased now was the entrepreneur wealth maker in the family who ran quite a profitable heating and ventilation business. Uh, he was the managing director and like in the case of Rick's, the quote, driving force of the business. Now, at the time, the wife who became the claimant and their two sons were directors and worked within the business. And at first instance, the claimant brought a claim for lost years, totaling 4.4 million odd. At trial, the claimant was awarded zero. Um, the basis of that was that the business would continue to profit equally even after the deceased's death. On appeal, however, the claimant was successful and the decision was remitted back to a master for an assessment of damages. In terms of the big principles, um, there are a few again, but mainly the purpose and the point of this case is to stress that lost years claims as distinct from Fatal Accidents Act claim require an assessment of the value of the earnings and capacity personally lost, okay? And, and that is a loss of earnings from work. So like in Rick's, albeit a different premise, loss of earnings from a passive capital investment is not a loss of earnings from work. Two down, one to go now. The third and final case, which Steve and I talked about quite recently, is the case of Hill. That was also a 2021 decision and also a Court of Appeal case. Again, a comparable set of circumstances. In that case, the claimant was the widow of a deceased husband who died again of mesothelioma. Um, he was actually a builder and the claimant was a nurse by profession. However, in this case, the issue was not really about any kind of family business at all. In fact, the two had actually fostered two siblings, aged 13 and nine, who were both uh, autistic. Now, shortly before the deceased illness, they'd agreed as a couple that the claimant wife was gonna to return to work as a full-time nurse in due course. Now, after the deceased death, the claimant continued to receive the money that was attributable to the foster care, totaling something like £50,000, and was unable to go back to work as a nurse because she had to care for the children. So she brought a claim for a dependency loss under the Fatal Accidents Act on the basis of her lost earnings as a nurse, but also and in the alternative as a claim for care expressed on the commercial basis. Now, the judge at first instance found that the dependency was the claimants and not any kind of business arrangement and found that the appropriate measure of the loss was the commercial value of the replacement services. What then happened, just to complicate matters more, after the first instance decision, um, the children were removed by the local authority, rendering the whole first instance decision a little bit of a farce. On appeal, the Court of Appeal was prepared to take into account those changing circumstances. So without getting too bogged down in the detail, in terms of the big principles, the Court of Appeal had to consider firstly what to do about the changing circumstances, and the Court of Appeal decided that new evidence should be admitted um, based on a matter of discretion and degree. And the test really about whether or not to refuse to admit the evidence is about whether or not the changing circumstances means that the first decision feels like an affront to a sense of justice. In this case, they thought it did, and they were prepared to entertain the change in circumstances. So whilst generally dependency is fixed at the date of death, it is gonna be with qualifications if the situation changes enormously. In terms of the substance to the main claim, however, the big takeaway is that where earnings have been lost, when valuing services dependency claims, the commercial rate of care may be appropriate in cases such as this. So that's a run through in, I think, just under 10 minutes, the three cases that we've spoke about over the last three sessions. I'm now going to hand over to Stephen, who's going to explain this fictional scenario 
and then start to deal with some of the questions that arise out of it. So over to you, Stephen. Thanks, Hilton. So the last page of the handout that we've sent round has the simple set of facts that we're going to uh, talk about and the issues arising that we're going to touch on in a practical sense. It's a simple set of facts, which is really just a structure for us and for you to think about the practical application of some of the issues that Hilton summarised that arose in Rick's head and he'll straight with them. The basic scenario we've got is we have a, a claimant who will, on our factual case, inevitably soon be deceased because it's a context is a clinical negligence claim where there's been a negligent delay in the diagnosis of lung cancer. And the result of that has been the development of a metastatic disease that would have been avoided and the prognosis is poor, although not untypical in these sorts of cases with a life expectancy of somewhere between two and four years. Now, the, uh, the claimant is the owner and he's the uh, managing director of a shop selling textbooks, so he's something of a, an entrepreneur and he earns £50,000 from the business and £25,000 more passively from letting the office above the shop. His wife, who will be the claimant uh, in the event that there's a Fatal Accident Act claim, has never worked. She brought up the children, although she has attended uh, a course in bookkeeping. And the plan is that she would work in the shop when the youngest child left home and the income from that would be uh, £12,500. And she will inherit the business and the rental property in the event of her husband's death. Uh, one of the factual scenarios which is more relevant to what Hilton will talk about is that she will subsequently sell the business to one of the children and she's going to keep the property and rent it out. The questions or issues that we want to talk about in a practical sense that have been inspired by that is first of all the question that will arise in cases like this about whether this is a lost year or a fatal accident act claim and it's probably better to say that this is inspired by the three cases that we previously covered rather than something that is uh, a result of any of those decisions. Um, our scenario, we have a still living but terminally ill claimant. It's not at all uncommon in a clinical negligence uh, context usually, but not exclusively in the context of delayed diagnosis of cancer. And obviously it's very common in mesothelioma cases for those of you that deal with that. It's less common Otherwise, and there is probably many of us who haven't seen this in practice. The aim in talking about this is to have us think about the differences, the pros and cons of bringing a claim by the living claimant as opposed to uh, a claim by the estate and a dependency claim. In other words, waiting until the prognosis, until the claimant dies. There's a choice that has to be faced there. And the choice, of course, is the claimants and with the help of the claimant's family. And it's a difficult and it's an emotional one. Do they bring the claim while the claimant is alive or do they wait to bring it as a dependency claim? You need to advise, obviously, in that context. So you need to be comfortable with the issues. Uh, the differences it makes the quantum and the tactics involved. Hilton's going to then talk about financial dependency issues more directly uh, in the context of the the scenario we have arising from uh, Rips and Witham. And I will touch very briefly on the question in a practical sense of uh, service dependency claims. Both of those issues obviously are applicable to the Fatal Accident Act dependency scenario rather than the uh, living claimant one. So lost years or a dependency claim. I have been and I am involved in several such cases as I've said, they generally arise in clinical negligence in the context of delayed diagnosis of cancer, whether lung cancer, cervical cancer, breast cancer. And it's typically cancer cases because the prognosis in those sorts of cases is very often this sort of fairly short period of a few years. The difficulty of deciding between doesn't really arise in situations where a claimant may have lost years of life and may have lost decades, but that doesn't arise until decades down the road. In those situations, there really is no uh, decision to be made. It will be brought as a, a living claim with a lost year scenario. But when you've got a, a shortish duration, 
two to three years, four years or whatever, then it is a live choice. And the starting point really is that this is a red flag issue, it's something you need to know about. And it's something it's potentially negligent not to know and advise about. Indeed, one of the go to cases in considering these issues, a case called Thompson and Arnold, arose particularly on those sorts of that sort of situation where both solicitors in that case and counsel were negligent in that they didn't appreciate that if they settled the claim of the living claimant, they were prejudicing any potential dependency claim. You need to be aware, as I'm sure you all are, that if a dying claimant pursues his or her claim to a settlement or judgment, then if the claim is settled on a full and final basis in its entirety, there is no surviving cause of action at the date of the death, so that there's no cause of action that can be picked up under the Fatal Accident Act, and obviously there's no uh, cause of action for the estate either. So the choice is, do you bring or conclude a claim before or after the death of a terminally ill claimant? You need to be aware as a practitioner that in a traditional type scenario, particularly where you have uh, a non-working partner and young children, then a dependency claim will generally speaking be of higher overall value than a claim brought by a dying claimant. That's principally because of the way that the law treats the dying claimant or deceased's future earning potential. A lost years claim commonly works out to be of less value than the equivalent dependency claim. And that's at heart because at its most basic, the conventional discount for living expenses that is applied to the living claimant's future earnings is a higher discount than the conventional discount in a dependency claim. So in the scenario we have, the dying claimant has an income of £50,000 a year net. If that is brought as a lost years claim in the future, then the conventional starting point for a discount for living expenses is 50%. So that's a multiple can then of £25,000 a year. And there's usually then an argument about whether 50% is right, 60%, 70%, 80%, whatever. Those, that's open to the defendant. And it is a, uh, in my experience, it's more of a live issue in a lost years claim than it is in most dependency claims. If it's brought as a dependency claim after the uh, uh, claimant has died, then as a dependency claim in this scenario, a non-working dependent, assuming there are no children, would expect to recover two thirds of 50,000 of 50,000 pounds as a multiple account. So that's 33,300 and there's a difference of 8,300 pounds a year. The reason that there's a difference in principle is the way that the shared living expenses are dealt with. In a dependency claim, the whole of the shared living expenses are counted as part of a dependency. In a lost year claim, they're divided pro rata, so half and half. That's not the only reason why a dependency claim is usually larger. In a lost years claim, a living claimant can't recover the value of the unpaid services that he or she provides to the dependents, childcare, DOI, domestic assistance. And those of you that do uh, uh, fatal accident claims will know that particularly in this day and age, the services dependency is a very significant factor in a fatal claim. And it's not unusual to see services dependency claims outstrip the financial dependency claims, at least on the pleadings. So, that's not available in a lost years claim. There's obviously no bereavement award if you bring the claim on behalf of the dying claimant and there's no claim for funeral expenses and there's no claim for intangible benefits. Those last three factors may be of lesser significance, but they play into the equation as well. But it isn't always the case that a dependency claim will have a higher quantum than a claim brought on behalf of a living claimant. Like I've just said, the bereavement, funeral expenses and intangible benefit, benefits are probably not in themselves going to be determinative in making the difference. And on many uh, dependency cases, the services dependency may be very modest, maybe adult children who uh, 
who aren't in receipt of services. And on the facts, there may be little by way of services between the, uh, the deceased and the surviving partner. And if there's not much by way of a services dependency claim, there may well be little, if anything, by way of an intangible, intangible benefits claim either. And it's not particularly uncommon to see a lost years claim exceed in quantum uh, a financial dependency claim either. For example, if the deceased is, or if the dying claimant or deceased is a lower earning of the two partners, then there may be no or little financial dependency if you calculate it on the two thirds basis. So 50% of their income would be better than nothing on a two thirds basis in terms of quantum. If you go back to the scenario that we've got and we credit the wife with an earning capacity of 12,500 pounds, then the joint income is 62,500 pounds. Two thirds of that is 41,600 odd take off the survivor's income of 12,500 pounds and the multiplicand in a dependency claim then becomes just over 29,000 pounds versus the 25,000 pounds of a lost years claim. The multiplicand is still different by 4,000 pounds, but it's no longer, it's half the difference than it was when, uh, if she wasn't earning. And let's say that on a slightly different variation of the facts, the £50,000 income was properly to be split between the husband and the wife. Then the £50,000 would be the joint income. Two thirds of that would be £33,300. But you'd have to take off the wife's residual income of uh, £25,000. And in a dependency claim, the multiple can would only be £8,300. Whereby brought while the husband was still alive as a lost years claim, then 50% of his £25,000 would be £12,500. So on that fact, the multiple account, on that fact scenario, the multiple account would be higher in the lost years claim. And you also have to bear in mind that dependency often reduces and sometimes disappears uh, where in a pension only scenario. They're simple illustrations, but they serve to make the point. And the practice points are, one, you need to be aware of the issue. And secondly, to advise the claimant properly, you probably have to roughly calculate the case both on a lost years basis and a dependency basis. I uh, was in a case recently where I, uh, I advised the couple and I had to uh, look at the quantum and the lost years claim came in at over £300,000 and the dependency claim was under £300,000. And the reason for the difference was because there was no financial dependency claim when looked at on the two thirds basis. And although there was a service dependency claim to be brought, it didn't make up the difference in value uh, in the lost years basis. That's the quantum aspect of it. Obviously, there's much more to it than purely quantum when it comes to uh, deciding whether to bring the claim on behalf of the living claimant or wait until the claimant has, lied, has died. It's, it's a terribly important point, and the claimant and his family, the couple, whatever, may have a strong preference that they want to bring and settle a claim while the claimant is still alive to benefit from it. Other practical considerations are that uh, it may be that the prognosis is very uncertain, or it may be that it's disputed, or it may be that it's quite long, and it may just be impractical to postpone the claim until the uh, claimant has died. And there may be other overriding reasons why you need to commence the claim, at least while the claimant is still alive, uh, while the terminal Ill person is still alive. Liability may be an issue, for example, and you may need to have that resolved. It may be that limitation is an issue and the defendant won't agree extensions of limitation, so you, you just can't wait. The last one I'm going to uh, leave us with on this is that this may not have to be an entirely one way or another scenario. If everything aligns correctly on your behalf, it may be that you can organize matters that you can recover substantial damages for use by the dying claimant and yet preserve the dependency claim for the uh, dependents. You probably need a cooperative defendant in that scenario, but you might be able to agree an interim payment and then agree 
uh, extension of limitations or a delay is required to settle the claim later. Or you may be able to issue proceedings, perhaps deal with breach causation if you need to as a preliminary issue, get an interim payment, and then have the court uh, stay or adjourn the rest of the proceedings. That's all I want to say about the lost years claims uh, versus uh, uh, dependency. And Hilton's going to talk a little bit about uh, financial dependency now. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, so obviously as things stand, um, with the claimant slash deceased being a claimant and still alive, it's a lost years claim, but Steve's explained various pros and cons of pursuing a lost years versus a fatal accidents act claim. And let's assume you have Stephen Friday as your barrister and he advises you to wait and it becomes a fatal accidents act claim. One of the first questions that will cross your mind is, is there a financial dependency claim? So I'm gonna try and answer that in relatively straightforward terms. Um, if you're sat there thinking this is easy, well, that, that's fine. If you're sat there thinking this is hard, that's also fine. I suppose we're here to tell you that it's not that difficult if you follow the process. And our general advice would be just to break it down and apply the sort of principles that we've been talking about from those three cases and other cases. So breaking it down in this case involves looking at all the various possible sources of financial dependency, of which there are three, really. Um, the, the first is the 50K, uh, that's the income from the business. And the issue you're gonna have to ask yourself in relation to that is, is that income derived from the person's labor and skill? That's one of the RICS points, because if it is, then it forms part of the dependency and vice versa. And if it were mixed, it might be better claimed as a services dependency claim. Now here, we don't know definitively whether or not the business uh, was, uh, and the income rather was derived from his labor and skill, but I think it's probably safe to assume it was. Consequently, that 50K is gonna form part of the maths. The second question that you'd ask yourself is, what is the impact of selling that business having decided it's part of the maths? Well, here's another Rick's point really, because remember one of the fundamental principles is that dependency is fixed at the date of death. And the only way you could potentially undermine that would probably be most obviously with a Hill type argument about a probably a post judgment change in circumstances, which means the original decision is an affront to justice. So trying not to overcomplicate it, you, the first component of your claim is the 50K You've asked yourself the question and Rick's answers it for you. The second bit is the 25K, which was income derived from letting the flat above the shop. Well, it's a similar analysis. Was that income derived from their labor and skill? And again, it's not 100% clear based on our skeleton facts, but it looks safe to assume that that is not income derived from labor and skill, and that's income generated from a passive asset inherited by a claimant at this point. So consequently, it doesn't fall part of the dependency. And then the third, third possible component or factor, which is mentioned in the scenario, is the 12 and a half K. That's the money that the now claimant it says that she could have earned if she'd gone back to work. Now, maybe the uninitiated, of which there'll be none, uh, watching this I'm sure might think oh well potentially there's a loss of earnings claim on her behalf obviously if there isn't a fatal accident that claim is is not a personal claim of the claimants it's a claim which arises out of the relationship and the dependency however it might potentially be relevant depending on the detail or some variance in the facts so for instance those figures might form part of the premise in the calculation based on your conventional approach to the maths on the basis it's anticipated that at the time of the death, when you calculate the dependency, we assume that she would have gone back to work. Um, and also you would want to pry into some of the detail and make sure that she'd gone back to, not gone back to work because she was too upset, as opposed to for some other reason, for example, having to care for any of the children, which might potentially give rise to a hill type claim for the value of services required to look after the children. So 
Is there a financial dependency claim is always a big question. Hopefully it's not too big on this example. Uh, I'd just say if you break it down into its constituent parts, try and follow the rules which the case law tells us about, you can make it quite straightforward for yourself. So with an eye on the clock, I'm going to hand back to Steve to deal with our question number three, which is about whether or not there's a services dependency claim. Also with an eye on the clock, I'm going to take this shortly. I can see that we still have 77 of you here, but obviously you should feel free to log off uh, at any time. Now our skeleton facts obviously don't say anything particularly about a service dependency claim um, uh, or any services that the husband might have performed, but let's, let's just assume for the sake of argument that he did his reasonable share of childcare, DIY, domestic services, etc. With brevity in mind, I'm simply going to draw a few conclusions from the case of Hill and Witham. Some of these uh, are drawing on what Hilton has already said. The first point I would make is this, that if you're acting for the claimant, you should always claim a commercial rate for uh, the services dependency claim. And you should be astute to the different rates that are applicable for the different tasks, housekeeper, handyman, gardener, nanny, whatever is applicable on the facts. First of all, because it's a more coherent way of putting it. Second of all, it will be more persuasive when you have broken it down in that way. And thirdly, and perhaps equally important, it sends out the message that you know what you're doing in bringing this claim. And that may have practical benefits in terms of settling the claim. In most cases, certainly in my experience of fatal accident claim, it's tolerably uncontroversial that an expert report is uh, appropriate as a way of valuing the services dependency. The, yes, in most cases, it's not strictly speaking an OT or a nurse's report, but that doesn't usually stand in the way. And one of the reasons I think for this is that the defendants, generally speaking, will want a report of their own to give themselves some traction to make their own arguments, otherwise they will be without uh, evidence. Also, a hook to an expert's report in the clinical negligence setting, perhaps linking back to the sort of factual scenario we have, is that it may well be on your counterfactual case that the deceased will have had limitations anyway arising from treatment that was necessary in, in, in any event. So the counterfactual scenario in our case, for example, might well be that the deceased would have had limitations in any event as a result of surgery, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And there has to be an assessment of that in order to measure uh, the, uh, the size of the claim. It's also fair to say that experts will have access and provide evidence of the various commercial rates that are applicable. And in a practical sense, it's a convenient mechanism for tabulating the claim uh, rather than having to do it yourself. It is important, however, to cast a critical eye over experts' reports in this scenario and not to it, just accept it, because many experts will fall into errors of principle. For example, evaluating what care has, what services have in fact been uh, received or replaced rather than valuing the services as they would have been given. The, another practical point to take from uh, Hill is that if a judge adopts your commercial rate, there is no legal requirement to make a discount for gratuitous provision, whether it be 25% or the 33% that the NHSR historically argue for. However, there is, in my view, an ambiguity that's been left with from Hill. The Court of Appeal stopped short in that case of unambiguously endorsing a commercial rate in all contexts. If you read the judgment, what is stated is that it says where earnings have been lost, and Hilton picked up on this point when he was summarising it, the commercial rate of care may be appropriate. That, in some senses, that's an unhelpful observation because it's been tried in consideration by practitioners ever since Williams and Welsh Ambulance that nothing that you do after death can increase or decrease a dependency claim. So why should the loss of earnings that have uh, factored into the, uh, the care be a relevant factor. And also logically, 
if loss of earnings might justify a commercial rate for services, or even be the measure of the loss, then why shouldn't the absence of loss of earnings or the absence of employing somebody be argued by defendants to justify a non-commercial or even a back to the argument about a discounted rate? So in many senses, there are still things that are up for grabs on a practical level to be argued about. My final point in leaving on, uh, on this basis is, is that if I revert briefly back to the situation where we're bringing a lost years claim for a living claimant, it's very important that you get a care claim, particularly when one has a scenario such as a delayed diagnosis of cancer and one is looking at a terminal cancer prognosis. You will certainly want a care report linked into your oncology expert evidence as well to value the care that is going to be required in the final stages of the terminal illness. The last six or nine months of life will typically uh, go up through a 14 to 24 hours a day of uh, professional care and there will be aids and equipment uh, claims to be brought as well. At the same time, it may be sensible to get the same expert to address a post-death service dependency claim so that the evidence is there to help with valuing the claim. Hill, anything to say by way of uh, final summary? Um, well, hopefully everybody's found that useful. I'm amazed there's still 77 people here. Um, so thank you for sticking around. If you are wondering what the point of all of that was, um, apart from just doing the recap, which is useful in and of itself, I think what we wanted to show you is that no matter how complicated these cases might first appear, usually you can distill them down into their essential facts. And then if you follow the process, which involves breaking that down further and then applying the basic principles, that should at least enable you to identify the main issues and to enable to get all the right documents in place so that you can make a start on the maths. I mean, if you need to, obviously, you will go and instruct a highly competent barrister from PLP like Stephen to finish that off for you. But I suspect most of you on this session are fully capable of pleading claims like this day in day out so obviously it's difficult in this format to ask and answer questions but as i said at the beginning if you do have any questions please don't hesitate to email myself or stephen and if you're really keen this has been recorded it will be on the website and you can watch it back again so, Stephen, unless there's anything from you, I will just stop the recording and end the session. Nothing from me.